mixy. This month had it all. It may actually be the most we've ever packed into a PLN episode thus far. So if you've been doom scrolling on your phone thinking nothing good has been going on, feast your eyes and ears, comrades, and keep the good fight going. Indigenous communities in Mexico have taken over the Bonafont water bottling plant and are turning it into a cultural center. For four months, indigenous and local communities managed to blockade and shut down the plant in Puebla State. They called a meeting with authorities and Bonafont owners to discuss putting the plant to better use. When no officials showed up, they decided to occupy the building. The action coincided with the anniversary of the birth of Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata. Activists immediately disabled and destroyed security cameras within the plant and moved large structures to block other entrances. They shut down one of the wells within the plant that was used to extract water from the nearby volcanic springs. Bonafont had been extracting 1.4 million liters of water per day from indigenous communities. We are open to dialogue, but not to negotiation. Our communities declare this looting company closed, said one representative who spoke anonymously. Another community representative said, we have to defend what our ancestors left us with, this mother earth. Incredible and courageous action. I have said it before and I will say it again, land back here and everywhere. And that is especially if we'd like a livable future. A recent report by the Indigenous Environmental Network and Oil Change International found that Indigenous-led land defense has staved off 25% of the US and Canada's annual emissions. Indigenous-led resistance to 21 fossil fuel projects in the US and Canada over the past decade has stopped or delayed an amount of greenhouse gas pollution equivalent to approximately 400 new coal-fired power plants. In the face of the criminalization and demonization of those fighting to move beyond fossil fuel use, indigenous resistance can show us a way out, says Dallas Goldtooth, an organizer with IEN, an alliance of indigenous peoples who advocate for indigenous knowledge and natural law. Our movements are stronger when we connect the dots, he said. What indigenous peoples are providing is a roadmap for our allies and supporters to adopt as a way to address the climate crisis. Indigenous land and water defenders, like the Tiny House Warriors and the Defenders Fighting Enbridge's Line 3, are continuing to fight projects that would dump more than 800 million metric tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere each year. Goldtooth said, from an indigenous perspective, when we are confronting the climate crisis, we are inherently confronting the systems of colonization and white supremacy as well. In order to do that, you have to reevaluate how you relate to the world around you and define what your obligations are to the world around you. It's more than just stopping fracking development and pipelines, and it's more than just developing clean energy. It's about actually fundamentally changing how we see the world itself. Indeed, the world will be a much better place when we decolonize and when settlers finally learn to live in the indigenous nations they inhabit. And in Australia, the Mirar traditional owners celebrated the end of uranium mining on their country at the start of this year, marking the end of 40 years of mining operations which the Gunjiaimi Aboriginal Corporation said was imposed on traditional owners by the Commonwealth government. Since then, 14 people have become the first Aboriginal Jeruba Rangers to obtain a certificate in conservation and land management, and moving forward, they will be managing their own country through an indigenous protected area. Jeruba Ranger manager Jane Blackwood said, it will see the town Township become known for its research in North Australian biodiversity, ecology, education, indigenous language, cultural heritage, and archaeology, and a gateway for education-based tourism. In December of last year, we reported on the massive farmers' protests in India fighting against Modi's neoliberal farm laws, and we're happy to report that they are still going strong. This month, one million farmers from across the country gathered in Muzaffarnagar, turning the entire city into a rallying ground. It was organized by the Samyukt Kisan Morcha, or SKM, which is a coalition of over 40 Indian farmers' unions. The farmers resolved to teach a lesson to the Hindu nationalist BJP in the upcoming elections and said that the farmer labor issue would defeat the oppressive and casteist politics of the BJP, although admittedly more should be done to center Dallas and other working class and lower caste people. The SKM called for a general strike on September 27th, supported by other parties and trade unions. They wrote, it was on September 27th, 2020, that President Sri Ram Nath Kovind ascended to and brought into force the three anti-farmer laws last year. So September 27th, there will be a total Bharat band observed around the country from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. The strike is going on now as I record this, so we will follow up on this action next month and solidarity with everyone fighting privatization in India. 
40,000 Italian comrades flooded the streets of Florence this month in support of 422 GKN workers who were fired via email in July, despite the factory doing quite well. Workers have been occupying the plant since July and refused to leave, fighting back against the capitalist plan to maximize profits by laying workers off and relocating. The Labor Court of Florence has revoked the company's initiation of the dismissal procedure, qualifying the conduct of the company as anti-union according to Article 28 of the Workers' Statute. The workers are cautiously optimistic, but the mobilization continues as there is no salvation outside the mobilization, workers say. Drafting without truce writes, it's not just about defending a factory, it's not just about those 450 jobs. We are at the beginning of the storm. There will be dozens of GKN, dozens of companies where workers will find themselves faced with the arrogance of the bosses with thousands of layoffs. Now it is a question of broadening the front of the struggle, taking the example of the GKN workers to a more general level. This is what solidarity looks like and we absolutely love to see it. Last month, we reported on the major Nabisco strike at bakeries and distribution centers across the US. That strike has now ended as unionized workers voted overwhelmingly in favor of a new collective bargaining agreement. Although some Portland employees opposed ratifying the contract, calling for better terms, it garnered the necessary support from workers there and at facilities in Colorado, Virginia, Illinois, and Georgia. The new agreement includes 60 cent per hour wage increases each year for four years, higher company matches to 401k contributions, a $5,000 bonus for all employees, and it blocks Mondelez planned healthcare cuts. However, it doesn't kill Mondelez's plan to implement 12-hour weekend shifts with no overtime, which would mostly apply to new workers who take weekend crew roles, which is really not great. Despite some workers' disappointment with this point, 75% of workers approved of the agreement with some being so ecstatic that they were in tears. Anthony Shelton, president of the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers and Grain Millers International Union, said this has been a long and difficult fight for our striking members, their families and our union. Throughout the strike, our members displayed tremendous courage, grit and determination. Cameron Taylor, an agent at BCTGM Local 364 in Portland, said the strike sent a message to all corporations that workers are not going to get pushed around, even if they are multi-billion dollar corporations. HelloFresh, the popular food kit delivery company, doubled its US revenue to $2.8 billion over the course of the pandemic, all the while its workers couldn't afford rent, suffered serious workplace injuries, and had their bathroom breaks subjected to strict time limits with no consideration given to the time it takes to remove their sanitary gear. In response, 1,300 HelloFresh workers are unionizing two factory kitchens in Colorado and California under the banner of Unite Here, the National Hospitality and Service Industry Union. According to the union, HelloFresh workers in the Bay Area are signing up in droves. The workers will be the first in the booming food kit industry to unionize, which will undoubtedly have a cascading effect on other workplaces in the industry. Lily Vasquez, a packaging line worker, said lots of us are excited. We are sure a union is what we want and what we need to have the change we need to make. I am worried for a lot of the people working at HelloFresh. A lot of us have injured hands and pain in our feet, but we work through the pain because we won't get paid if we go home. We need this change immediately and I know we are going to achieve it. In response, the company predictably hired anti-union consultants and held mandatory anti-union meetings, but the workers are not having any of that and unionization is impending. Fantastic and go get them guys. Electrical cooperatives across the U.S. are supporting efforts to restore power to affected members in Louisiana and Mississippi, the states most affected by Hurricane Ida. According to the Association of Louisiana Electric Cooperatives, or ALEC, several Louisiana electric cooperatives were between 90 to 98% down. Electric co-ops that were not affected by the storm in Louisiana, along with co-op crews from Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Oklahoma, Missouri, Florida, and Kentucky, were quick to come to the rescue. Adi Armanto, Alex's interim CEO, said our mutual aid network consists of about 22 states where we can pull additional help to restore power. We can also work through that network to acquire hard to find materials. Although being without power is not PLN, it is positive to witness the power of networks of cooperatives working together. The government of Kosovo has announced that all student fees for the next academic year at the bachelor's and master's level would be free of charge. They said they are also working on removing fees at the PhD level. They said education is a right for which no student should pay. We agree, end the fees everywhere. And Berliners have voted yes in a referendum proposing that authorities in Berlin seize more than 200,000 homes from private companies and bring them into public ownership. 
Berliners want to pass a law which would allow for the expropriation of private real estate companies, specifically those that own more than 3,000 housing units. The campaigners say that companies would be compensated at a rate well below market value. Just to get on the ballot, the referendum organizers had to collect 175,000 handwritten and fully verified signatures. Now, more than 1 million people have voted in favor of the official referendum, giving the measure powerful popular support. Unfortunately, the measure is not legally binding and the proposal will only become law if the ruling parties in the Berlin Senate choose to make it so. It is unclear how things will move forward, but incredible to know that the public support is there, which will hopefully pressure government officials to act. Content warning for rape in this next section of the news. After a year of inaction from the campus administration, the police, and the courts with regard to a documented drugging and rape of a freshman student, students at the University of Iowa took matters into their own hands. On September 1st, thousands of students descended on the Phi Gamma Delta, or Fiji frat, demanding the rapists show themselves and demanding that the university abolish the frat. The multi-billion dollar house was eventually breached and completely ransacked, but the rapists had fled to an associated frat house across town. The righteous students with even greater numbers made their way to the other frat house, which promptly received the same treatment. Windows smashed, cars flipped, beers liberated, and tags of rapists painted throughout. Police were powerless to stop the 2,000-strong United Student Front, and no arrests were made. Let this be a lesson to all abusers. The people aren't taking your shit anymore. If you're going to fuck around, you're going to find out. On September 7th, Mexico's Supreme Court unanimously ruled that penalizing abortion is unconstitutional, effectively decriminalizing abortion in the world's second largest Roman Catholic state. The ruling comes as a result of a feminist movement which has been growing and taking to the streets for years. Coahuila state government said the ruling would be retroactively effective and anyone in prison for abortion would be immediately released. 26-year-old Carla Cihuatel, one of the demonstrators celebrating the historic ruling, said we're very happy that abortion has been decriminalized and now we want it to be legal. Carla is a member of the feminist organization Frente Feminista in Saltillo, who continue to push for the rights of all of those with uteruses in Mexico. The California legislature has unanimously passed a bill making it illegal to remove a condom without consent, a hideous practice known as stealthing. Governor Newsom, who is staying on at his position after Californians voted not to recall him, is expected to sign the bill into law before October 10th. Doing so will make the Golden State the first to recognize stealthing as an illegal violation of sexual consent. The bill amends the civil code to allow victims of stealthing to sue perpetrators for damages. Christina Garcia, the assemblywoman who introduced the bill, says she was inspired by a 2017 article on stealthing written by a then third-year student at Yale Law School, Alexander Brodsky. Brodsky is now a civil rights attorney with a nonprofit, Public Justice. Pride Place, a 118-unit LGBTQ affirming affordable housing development for seniors, broke ground this month in Capitol Hill. The building will include a 4,400-square-foot senior community and health services center. This groundbreaking represents an enormous milestone for the local LGBTQ community, said Stephen Nipp, executive director at Gen Pride. It is the culmination of nearly a decade of hard work by people who recognize the need to support our elders who fought and won the rights we enjoy today, as well as create a place for generations to come. Gen Pride collaborated with Community Roots Housing, one of the largest affordable housing providers in Seattle, to make the development a reality. In Cuba, the draft of a new family code was released this month, which proposes allowing same-sex couples to marry and adopt, as well as giving children greater participation in decisions that affect them. The draft must be passed by the Cuban parliament and then go on to a grassroots plebiscite. Three years ago, the government backed away from enshrining gay marriage protections under pressure from evangelical groups, but backers are more hopeful today. Justice Minister Oscar Silvera Martinez and Yamila Gonzalez Ferrer, Vice President of the National Union of Jurists of Cuba, emphasized that the proposed family code is much broader than an authorization of same-sex marriage. Gonzalez said it protects all expressions of family diversity and the right of each person to establish a family in coherence with the constitutional principles of plurality, inclusion, and human dignity. The UK Court of Appeal has today overturned the judgment handed down in Bell v. Tavistock by the Divisional Court and rejected the claim for judicial review. This means that rather than forcing patients to go through a court process to gain access to puberty delaying treatment, which would put it out of reach for many trans youth, clinicians can exercise their judgment around the referral of patients for the treatment. This is a great decision for trans youth and we hope that referrals will soon be reinstated. 
In Wisconsin, the Madison Cares program launched this month, which is another program that sends specialists to nonviolent mental health calls instead of police. We've highlighted a few other programs operating in Toronto, Denver, and Eugene, Oregon, and it's so encouraging to see the model catching on. CARES consists of two response teams comprised of one Madison Fire Community paramedic and one Journey Mental Health Crisis worker. These teams are trained and equipped to respond to nonviolent behavioral health emergency calls, meaning fewer people's lives will be endangered by having the cops show up with guns. Fantastic program, as the more we can divest away from the police, the better. And we love to see these things fall. A giant statue of Robert E. Lee has been taken down in Richmond, Virginia, the national capital of the Confederacy. In a 7-0 decision, Virginia's Supreme Court said the city could remove the statue, citing testimony from historians that the statue was erected in 1890 to honor the Southern white citizenry's defense of a pre-Civil War life that depended on slavery and the subjugation of Black people. In Norway, the Conservatives have been ousted in this month's election, which focused heavily on the issue of climate change. Despite losing a seat, the center-left Labour Party is taking government. The Eco-Socialist Socialist Left Party gained two more seats for a total of 13, which is their best result since 2009, and the Revolutionary Socialist Red Party, which entered Parliament for the first time in the last election, went from one seat to eight seats, which is very significant. The Greens also won two more seats, three in total, after holding one seat in Parliament since 2013. The right-wing blue parties have been thoroughly routed, leaving them with only 68 of the 169 seats in the Storting and bringing an end to almost a decade of conservative rule in Norway. And you know who hates the Austrian School of Economics? Austrians, apparently. That's right, the Communist Party got the most votes in the city council elections in Graz, Austria. The Communists and Greens now hold 24 of 48 seats on the city council and 4 out of 7 Senate seats. This is Austria's second biggest city and a significant win as it was conservative for two decades. LK Carr will be the first Communist mayor in the nation's history. Harvard University has announced it will end its investments in fossil fuels after years of public pressure. President Lawrence Bacow said the endowment managers don't intend to make any more direct investments in companies that explore or develop fossil fuels, and that its legacy investments in private equity funds with fossil fuel holdings are in runoff mode and will end as these partnerships are liquidated. Activists, students, and alumni have been calling on the university to take action by selling off its fossil fuel holdings for ages, with those demands growing louder in recent years. Supporters of divestment have filed legal complaints, stormed the field of the 2019 Harvard-Yale football game, staged campus protests, and gained seats on school governance boards. Advocacy group Fossil Fuel Divest Harvard called the decision proof that activism works, plain and simple. Mexico has become the first country in North America and the 41st country globally to officially ban cosmetic animal testing. The new law also bans the manufacture, import, and marketing of cosmetics tested on animals elsewhere in the world. Although the ban will come into effect in two years' time, it's a major step forward for animal welfare. Berlin's university canteens are going almost meat-free as students prioritize climate change. The 34 canteens and cafes catering to Berlin's sizable student population at four different universities will offer from October a menu that is 68% vegan, 28% vegetarian, and 2% fish-based, with a single meat option offered four days a week. Daniela Kumle said we developed a new nutritional concept mainly because students have repeatedly approached us with the request for a more climate-friendly offer at their canteens. Critics of the vegan movement will rightfully point out that individual consumer choices can never offer a full solution, but it's not individual action when you're changing the operations of institutions, which is why the movement must not be a mere strict grocery list, but a radical political movement for total human and animal liberation and climate justice that involves organizing to change laws like ag-gag laws, to pressure governments to end subsidies to the meat and dairy industries, to fight for the rights and well-being of farm workers, to decolonize food systems respecting indigenous sovereignty, and to make food a social right for all, among other struggles. Indigenous Martu Rangers, who manage over 34 million acres of their country in the Great Sandy and Little Sandy Deserts in Australia, made history by capturing the fourth ever photograph of the elusive night parrot. The night parrot is a threatened species rarely witnessed by humans. Less than 30 people have seen the bird alive this century. For two years, the rangers searched for the species, finally locating them in Salt Lake Country. Night parrots are known to vocalize near their nests around dawn and dusk, so rangers braved icy desert nights listening for their calls. 
On a recent trip to the area, desert-born Marchu elders recognized the species calling in the night and provided the ranges with its Marchu name. By finding the roosting sites of the little-known birds, it is hoped that the rangers can learn more about their ecology, which will then inform targeted conservation efforts. As the climate crisis is accelerating biodiversity loss and leaving us all in a state of doom, indigenous knowledge and land management is crucial. So land back everywhere, but it's also majorly uplifting to see animal comrades surviving and thriving against all odds. On that note, scientists and conservationists are celebrating the discovery that three critically endangered killer whales in British Columbia, Canada are pregnant. Aerial drone research by scientists in Washington state has researchers hopeful that the three young will help bring their species back from the brink. It's pretty exciting and it's very significant, said biologist Lance Barrett Leonard. The southern resident population of which the J-pod belongs to is critically endangered. In most years, they have no reproduction at all. So having three pregnancies is good. It's exciting. This is what the pod needs. Researcher Josh McInnes said fingers crossed that they all are successful and the calves survive. Researchers and conservationists are also celebrating the discovery of a secret colony of highly endangered marmots on Vancouver Island. The discovery of the colony of around 10 to 12 individuals in Strathcona Park signals a great step forward in the recovery of the highly endangered species. Adam Taylor, executive director of the Vancouver Island Marmot Recovery Foundation, said the discovery of the colony complete with adults, yearlings, and pups in Strathcona Park was a thrilling sign. We've been waiting years to see this, Taylor said. Vancouver Island marmot populations have plummeted in past decades because of habitat loss, reaching a low of 27 in 2003. Captive breeding programs have helped maintain about 200 wild individuals, but researchers hadn't seen any disperse on their own, especially in Strathcona Park, which is difficult terrain for them to survive in. Seeing that there are colonies such as this existing and thriving on their own is a major step forward for their recovery. And we've saved the most radical of revolutionaries till the end. A group of capybara comrades have been reclaiming their rightful homes inside Argentina's most well-known gated community, Nord Delta, which is a luxury enclave for the rich in Buenos Aires. Environmentalists have always criticized the fact that the gated community exists as it was built on the wetlands of the Parana, the second longest river in South America after the Amazon. Recently, capybaras have taken up their rightful residence and destroyed the rich residents' manicured lawns. Prominent ecologist Enrique Viale said it's a mistake to frame the influx as an invasion. It's the other way around. Nordelta invaded the ecosystem of the Carpinchos, said Viale, who has been campaigning with many others for 10 years now for Congress to pass a law to defend the wetlands from development. We are happy to highlight the rodent vanguard of the class struggle. Viva los Carpinchos! Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to veganvanguardpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Halcyon for the positive news background. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. Thank you also to our incredible patrons who make the show possible. To help keep it going, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news, or you can give us a one-time tip or donation via PayPal. The link is in the description box below. We like to have those good news. Yeah, come on. Sometimes. Sometimes.